Hello everyone, this is Professor Casey. Welcome back. Today we are continuing our journey through the early portion of American history, discussing um, what lines up with the second chapter of David Emery Shy's America, A Narrative History. And today we're discussing the beginning of um, the explorations of the English. Okay. Um, we've already taken a look at the Spanish Empire and what they've been able to accomplish in the New World. Um, and compared to the English, the Spanish are fairly limited. Okay, the English are the ones that arguably have the best long-term success when it comes to establishing permanent colonies uh, with, you know, eventually um, having a, a long-term presence in the New World. Okay, so this is kind of the, um, the beginning of real permanent European uh, presence in the New World. Okay, so we'll get into some of the early uh, established colonies now uh, on the British part. Now, the first one we can talk about is something that begins back when Elizabeth I was still uh, the monarch of England. Okay, so we have to go back in time a little bit. Um, in 1578, when Elizabeth's reign is still kind of at its peak, okay, she has uh, uh, been ruling for, you know, a, a couple of decades by this point. She's in, you know, a fairly um, solidified presence in England, right? She's already established the Church of England as being kind of the official dictate and so forth. And this is kind of the period that we call the golden age of, um, of uh, English history, okay? Uh, so what Elizabeth does here is she charters uh, a man named Sir Humphrey Gilbert, who you see here, uh, to establish the first permanent English colony in America. Okay? Um, Elizabeth realizes after the destruction of the Spanish Armada, for example, that the Spanish have really been crippled in terms of their ability um, to you know, prevent any other European power from establishing dominance anywhere. Okay? So Elizabeth is really seizing the opportunity here to do this. So she provides money for Gilbert to go to the Americas and establish a colony and perhaps gain a foothold there. Okay. Unfortunately, um, for one thing, Gilbert is actually aiming for um, the, the point known now as Narragansett Bay. This is around where the, the Virginia colony is a, a eventually established. But unfortunately, he is actually blown uh, quite a bit further north by rough seas and actually lands in Newfoundland all over again. Okay, remember, Newfoundland is kind of the area where uh, several explorers over the centuries have managed to uh, land, including the Vikings back several centuries even before this, um, and even um, uh, John Cabot, right, the first English explorer to land in America. Okay? Um, Gilbert, of course, is having a really rough time with this the entire way, right? He's not really able to accomplish what he sets out to do, and he eventually decides he's going to turn around and go back to England, and unfortunately, in 1583, a massive storm surge happens on his way back, and all of his ships go down in the seas, and everyone on board is killed. Okay, so very, very rough start for England in terms of this. Eventually, his brother, Sir Walter Raleigh, is given uh, another charter by Elizabeth to try to accomplish the exact same thing, and Raleigh is the one who actually succeeds in doing so. Okay? He colonizes um, the area uh, that's uh, under the star here on the map called Roanoke Island. Okay? Uh, and as you can see here, this is, in, of course, off the coast of North Carolina. Okay? The, um, the, there's a, a large kind of uh, island chain here that's almost like a, a protective reef around the island that you would have to sail through in order to get into protected waters. And Raleigh does manage to land there and establish a, a semi-permanent colony um, called Roanoke. Okay, And Roanoke has kind of gone down in history as being one of the very first major um, American mysteries in terms of how it relates to European colonization. Okay. And the story goes is that in 1587, the governor of Roanoke, after it's been established by Raleigh, a man named John White, who you see here at the bottom, um, decides he is going to leave behind several hundred colonists uh, to return to England for supplies. Okay? And the journey to get back to England is a very long one okay? um, by ship. Of course, at this point, there is no real 100% um, accurate navigation really to go into any of this. And it takes several months to get from point A to point B. Okay? You have to cross the entirety of the Atlantic Ocean to get there. Okay? And so storms can happen, as we've already seen. Winds can blow people off course. Uh, they can be stuck out uh, on, on a dead sea if there is no wind. Right? All kinds of things can happen. So he leaves behind 100 colonists, including 26 women and children, on Roanoke. 
Okay, and remember, this is kind of the this is the only permanent English colony that there is. And in, in this particular region of the um, of the Americas, right, there are no Spanish colonies anywhere around either. Okay, you'd have to go much further south to even encounter the Spanish. Okay, and the French haven't had any success yet with uh, with any colonization nearby either. Right, they've landed further north in Canada. They're making a few excursions here and there, but the English are effectively alone here, except for Native Americans. Okay. So John White goes to England. Um, when he comes back, it takes him until 1590 to get back to the colony. Um, and you know, by this point, he's worried because he has left behind uh, children and grandchildren uh, in this particular area, um, trying to, you know, get back to his family and everything. And when he comes back, he finds the entire, um, you know, makeshift village that the that the colonists have built completely abandoned. Okay, and all the colonists are missing. Okay, so this is, um, again, this is a major, major mystery that still to this day has not been um, satisfyingly solved. Okay, the only clue that was left behind for, uh, for White to kind of figure out uh, where everybody had gone is the word Croatoan, which is um, uh, still kind of has mysterious origins as well. And this word was carved into um, one of the posts on the uh, on the palisades around the the fence around the uh, the village itself, and also carved into the trunk of a tree nearby. Okay, and the most common explanation that people have come up with for this is that um, White instructed the colonists to leave behind some kind of message or some kind of direction to let him know if they have to get up and vacate uh, suddenly. Okay, um, and the the closest that he's been able that we've been able to come up to with this is the, the Croatan Indians who are nearby, okay, inhabiting the, the marshlands and some of the islands uh, around that specific area. Um, and John White actually, to his credit, actually does go on a very uh, lengthy expedition after this to try to figure out what's happened to everybody. Remember his, his own family, his, I believe it's his daughter and his granddaughter are in the midst of all this, right? And they've, they've gone missing. Um, and he, he searches all the islands around, he asks the Native Americans when and where he can through interpreters, and nobody can explain what has happened to the colonists, okay? Um, and they are, were never found and still have never been found, okay? So it's a, it still remains a major mystery here. Um, the, the word Croatoan, some people believe that the, um, uh, that the colonists have managed to get in with the Croatan Indians and were able to kind of assimilate into the tribe, maybe intermarry, move further inland. Um, of course, there's all kinds of theories that they succumbed to disease or were wiped out by a neighboring tribe who were violent. Right? There's, there's all kinds of theories here, but there's very little evidence to go on, okay, aside from this very mysterious word, okay. So, um, again, very big major mystery that um, still kind of tickles the fancy of many historians today. And by the time Elizabeth dies in 1603, there are still no English colonies in America, okay? Despite multiple attempts, uh, it, it seems, uh, you know, for all she can tell that this is a, a cursed endeavor, right? That there really is no uh, way that the English are going to, to accomplish this anytime soon, okay? So again, it's kind of ironic that the English have the best long-term success when they have so many false starts like this. Now, when it comes to the Spanish Empire, as we've already said, um, the destruction of the Spanish Armada during Elizabeth's reign is one of the biggest disasters that the Spanish end up encountering because they are the ones that have the most wealth um, up to this point, okay? And most of the wealth that they have accumulated has been essentially invested in trying to find more gold in the New World. Okay. And they're gradually beginning to realize at this point that it's uh, turning into a failed endeavor as well. Okay. By the beginning of the 16th century, right, once we get into the 1500s, the Spanish Empire is pretty vast. Okay. As you can tell here, all of the green portions on the map uh, from Europe all the way into uh, uh, southwestern, central, and South America on uh, the east and west coasts of Africa, all the way down into India and even into Southeast Asia are occupied in some aspect by the Spanish Empire. Okay. And again, most of the ambitions uh, for Spain at this point are going into trying to find more gold in the New World, right? Because this is an area they believe to be completely untapped. Uh, again, their, uh, their conquest of the Aztec Empire has really wet, whetted their appetite 
um, for, for gold and for valuables. And they think that more and more tribes exist out there that have this level of wealth. Um, and it seems, you know, for all their endeavors that the Aztecs are really there, um, are going to be kind of the peak of their conquest here. Okay. No other tribe really has this level of wealth that we know of. Okay. Uh, whether the Spanish had any other success anywhere else in the new world to this particular level, um, historians don't know about it. Okay. At, at this particular point, it seems like that's really where they hit their peak is with the Aztecs. Um, and of course, with this level of expansion, with all the gold that they're pouring into this, and also with the, uh, the new conflicts brewing back home with the Protestant Reformation, um, all the religious conflicts that are beginning to broil and, and boil over in Spain and France and elsewhere, um, the, uh, the Spanish Empire is approaching bankruptcy very quickly. Okay? So they've overextended themselves, they've stretched themselves way too thin on this. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're heading toward disaster here is what it amounts to. Um, the other problem with New Spain, too, is, again, it's, it's something that they've targeted to be what is called a profit-based colony. Okay, so in other words, they're not looking to necessarily settle it permanently with colonists. They're looking to get as much natural resources out of it, strip mine the place, basically, and move on to the next zone. And they're basically coming up empty-handed constantly. Okay, so they're pouring more money into it than they're getting out of it. Okay, so it's uh, it's becoming kind of a, a black hole, a money pit for them, so to speak. And of course, Catholicism has been utilized up until this point as a, as a, a means of imposing power over the Native Americans, especially right um, Spanish priests, Jesuits in particular, who are kind of the more um, fundamentalist slash fanatic branch of the Catholic Church at this point, are brought into um, not only educate, but forcibly convert the natives, okay? So there are several um, instances, particularly in South America, where this ends up um, becoming very, very violent. Many hundreds and thousands of natives end up losing their lives um, through, through you know, the practice of this, okay? So it's, um, it's, it's something where the natives are uh, suffering for it, and in many cases, they end up fighting back as well, okay? So it's, it's a, a very tough slog through all this is basically what it amounts to. And again, the native labor is really all the, um, the colonists have to rely on here, okay? Uh, anybody who actually does come to live there, priests, uh, if it happens to be, you know, soldiers or something like that, a few military governors and their families perhaps might end up living there, um, but by and large, it's a temporary presence, okay? And again, the natives are not always willing to work those who survive. Okay. And many of them end up dying off anyway from disease. Okay. So again, there's, there's several different stumbling blocks that end up just com kind of compounding over time. And it ends up causing Spain to really lose a lot of ground here. And as I said before, tons and tons of instances of native revolt. Okay. The natives are not just um, like uh, Columbus believed them to be. Right? They're, they're not willing to just kind of roll over and give the Europeans whatever they want. They realize that these are men just like they are, and they have greed and all kinds of things attached to them. Okay? So the natives uh, end up becoming as much of a stumbling block as anything else. Now, another group that we can discuss here, and one that has uh, really fallen into popular culture and popular imagination, especially when it comes to English colonists, are the Puritans, okay? And the Puritans kind of have their beginning with the reign of uh, King James of England. Here he is. Um, King James is a, a kind of a pivotal figure in British history uh, because he ends up being the one who unites England and Scotland into what we now know as the United Kingdom, okay? Um, remember, before Elizabeth's death, okay, before she actually is able to pass on the crown to an heir, James was already king of Scotland. Okay? Scotland was actually a separate kingdom in and of itself, ruled initially by his mother, Mary, Queen of Scots, and after her death, he ends up taking over. Okay? And then when Elizabeth dies, James is already uh, the next in line to the throne several lines down here, okay, and so he ends up stepping into the role of King of Scotland, so he is James the Sixth of Scotland and James the First of England, okay, so James the First because he is the first King of England by the name of James, that's really all it amounts to, and Scotland, we've had five other Jameses before, okay, so that's why he has two titles. Um, 
uh, incidentally, too, if you ever look at the Union Jack flag, right, the, the current flag of Great Britain, um, you'll notice that it's actually an overlay of the Scottish flag, which is a, a white X on a blue field, um, overlaid with the English flag, which is a red cross on a white field. Okay, so it's a combination of the two, and that's why we end up uh, seeing the Union Jack flag as it is. Um, of course, as I said before, James is the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, uh, who is Elizabeth's first cousin, so he is uh, a first cousin once removed here. Um, and James is a very different type of king than a lot of the other kings who have come before him in England, because rather than ruling by constitutional authority, okay, rather than saying, you know, he is, uh, he's got a parliament that is supposed to, you know, kind of uh, keep him in check and everything, which is something that goes back um, to uh, King John, right, who, you know, wrote the Magna Carta, right, this is something that goes back several hundred years before this, uh, about three you know, 300, 250, 300 years, give or take. Um, getting off track a little bit there. Um, James says that rather than ruling by constitutional authority, he believes that he rules England by divine right, okay? And it makes him a little bit more dangerous when he says that because he ends up enforcing um, the religious beliefs of the Church of England, which is now very firmly established in England, with an iron fist. Okay, and it makes him very, very unpopular with many of his subjects, okay? Um, not the least of whom, if you are a fan of Alan Moore's V for Vendetta, okay, if you've ever read the graphic novel, if you've watched the film, um, this is the king who is targeted for the gunpowder plot, okay, by Guy Fawkes, okay? Um, Guy Fawkes was a Catholic who believed that James uh, was uh, unfit to rule because James was a Protestant, okay? James was an Anglican, believed that the Church of England was... Uh, you know, the one that was supposed to be in charge. Um, and so Guy Fawkes very unsuccessfully tries to load several barrels of gunpowder into a series of tunnels beneath Parliament to blow it up, collapse it, kill everybody inside, and eventually make it around to killing James as well. Um, of course, Fox is uh, arrested and hanged for his troubles. Um, and as I've already mentioned in a previous, um, uh, I believe I've mentioned anyway in a previous presentation, James, of course, is also uh, the one for whom the King James Bible is named, okay? Um, kind of carrying forward the tradition of Martin Luther and this idea that, um, that the, the common folk need to have a Bible printed in a language they can understand, because up until this point, any kind of scripture had been written in Latin, okay? Um, the, the New Testament form of the Bible was originally written in Greek, and over time, as it made its way further west, it was converted into Latin and then eventually made into um, you know, what we would call a Vulgate language, right? a common language. Right? So Martin Luther wanted the Bible printed in German, uh, and of course James ends up wanting it to be printed in common English as well. Okay? So, uh, and the King James Bible, uh, you know, religious importance to it aside, is uh, you know, a fairly important document in terms of being kind of a, a, a picture of the, um, the language of England during the time period. Okay? Um, it's worth noting that language ends up evolving quite a bit over time to the point where this is the kind of the beginning of the time period, you know, maybe even going back a, a couple of generations, where if you were transported back in time, you would be able to carry on a, a pretty decent conversation with a person back then, and you would be able to understand them. Okay. If you go back, you know, any further than that, really, um, the the level of evolution that English as a language ends up, um, you know, reaching, um, you wouldn't be able to understand them. Okay. So any kind of science fiction movie you ever see, um, where you know someone is transported back into the Middle Ages and can somehow carry on a conversation in perfect modern English with somebody is completely false. Okay. The language back then would have been, um, you know, as different as German and English are today. Okay. It's that, that much of a difference. Um, so anyway, all that. And one other bit of information too, uh, just as kind of a bit of trivia here about James. Um, James was also apparently very interested in the occult and demonology as well. So um, this would have been the time where William Shakespeare lived. And uh, Shakespeare uh, allegedly wrote the play Macbeth with James in mind, okay? So there's all kinds of elements of witchcraft and, you know, monsters and stuff kind of lurking in the, the background of all this in the midst of kind of this whole murder plot and stuff that goes on with the play itself. So he kind of envisioned uh, James as being Macbeth. And, you know, being James, the fact that James is a Scottish king, Macbeth was a Scottish king as well. 
So now back to the Puritans themselves. Um, the Puritans uh, are considered what are called religious dissenters or separatists. Okay? Um, they are Protestants, just like the uh, members of the Church of England are, but they are much, much more strict than the, uh, than the Anglicans are themselves. Okay. The Puritans, the, the name Puritan comes from the sense that the Puritans want to purify the Anglican church from any and all elements of Catholic belief system. Okay. So the Puritans want to shave everything down to the bare, bare minimum uh, of, of anything that it takes to be a Protestant Christian. Okay. So getting rid of any kind of uh, ornamentation, any statues, holy water, um, a lot of the ceremonies, right? Uh, the, the vestments, uh, jewelry, right? All that kind of stuff is considered to be extravagance or perhaps even idol worship in some cases, okay? And so that's why you see Puritans dress the way they are, right? They dress very, very plainly, okay? They're not richly ornamented. They don't wear jewelry. They wear two colors, black and white, okay? Men wear these uh, black tunics uh, with, you know, gloves, um, they wear, you know, these kind of pantaloons, sometimes with boots. Sometimes they might wear shoes with the buckles on them or something like that, the tall, wide-brimmed hat. And then women, again, are dressed very plainly as well. Kind of this black, uh, you know, long dress with long sleeves, not showing any kind of skin anywhere, right? Maybe, uh, perhaps not even at the neckline, okay? Uh, wearing, you know, some kind of a covering over the, their head, kind of out of religious duty. Um, so this is what we um, get the sense of when we think of the pilgrims, okay? And Puritans and pilgrims are virtually the exact same thing, okay? Um, the only difference is that a pilgrim is a Puritan who is going on a journey, okay? That's really all it amounts to, okay? And a pilgrimage, of course, is supposed to be something that is typically taken as a, a religious-based journey of some kind or a, a journey that has some kind of higher significance to somebody. Um, so again, they support this idea of purifying Catholicism from any and all rituals. Okay, so if you ever were to enter into a Puritan church, you would find it to be a very bare place. Okay, you wouldn't find, you know, giant crosses of gold. You wouldn't find images of, of Christ being crucified or anything like that. Uh, you probably wouldn't find any ornamentation. You might find a simple wooden cross and a pulpit up front and pews, and that might be it. Okay, so it was very, very... Um, very simplified. Uh, the Puritans are also considered to be self-governing congregations. Okay, so again, this is something that is one of the cornerstones of the Protestant belief system, right, handed down from Martin Luther, is that this is a, a democratized version of Christianity. So you don't necessarily have uh, an individual like a pope or a bishop or a cardinal or somebody like that telling you exactly how to believe, right? You have a system that works, and if everybody agrees that you know, their leader is actually practicing this particular belief system, then that person is allowed to stay in power, okay? So that's why you might have a, a preacher who, um, you know, is, uh, ends up uh, becoming an itinerant preacher or ends up changing from one church to another because maybe the church and the congregation don't believe with the way that that individual speaks. Um, and at this point in time, okay, James is um, enforcing the belief in England that anybody who is a citizen of England, anybody who is a citizen of the United Kingdom at large here, um, is required by law to attend Anglican services and an Anglican church. Okay? And the Anglican church, the official church of England at this point, still has a lot of imagery and a lot of the ornamentation and the vestments and the, the ceremonies and stuff that are basically carryovers from Catholicism, okay? Many Catholic churches end up being converted to Anglican use, okay? And people are required by law to attend these services, okay? You might have somebody literally at the door taking attendance, making sure that someone, you know, if you know, there's a member of the village who doesn't show up for one reason, unless they are just deathly ill or something like that, um, they could be arrested for not going to church. And so the Puritans, who do not want any part of these uh, particular ceremonies, right, they don't want any part of Anglican services, they believe that they're blasphemous and idolatrous and all this kind of stuff, the Puritans end up saying, we are not going to attend these services. Okay? And of course, that makes them a target for the law. Okay. So, of course, they are hunted down in many cases. You know, in some cases, the law tries to force them to, to attend these services. 
and eventually they realize that they are not going to be allowed to practice their own form of Protestantism here, and so they end up leaving England altogether, and this is when they actually become pilgrims. Okay? So eventually they end up leaving for the New World to establish some kind of Puritan-based colony there to get away from what they believe is religious tyranny in England. Now, not too long thereafter, okay, we, we fast forward a little bit here, um, we enter into a period that is called the English Civil War. And just like we had a, a, a civil war in, uh, in America, right, several hundreds of years in the future after this, um, England has its own civil war, okay, kind of going along with the same idea of, um, of what we're talking about here when it comes to religious beliefs. And it begins with the monarch Charles I, okay? Charles I is the son of James, okay? Um, and Charles, of course, is considered to be the next in line to the throne. He's believed to be the legitimate heir to James. Um, Charles, though, is very different, though, even from his father James, because Charles takes things a step further, okay? Even though James largely ends up ignoring Parliament, okay, because he believes he rules by divine right, um, his son takes it a step further by completely disbanding Parliament, okay, and he becomes an authoritarian king. Now, by doing that, this is something that is uh, a big red flag, okay, for the people of England, and it would be if we saw that happen in the United States. It would be the equivalent of the president suddenly deciding, if it was within his power, to disband Congress, okay? It would be getting rid of Congress altogether and the president having all the power. So that's essentially what Charles does here. He disbands Parliament from 1629, and they stay disbanded until 1640. Okay. Um, in the midst of all this, he also expands Anglican worship uh, north into Scotland, okay, and forces the Scots to convert uh, to Anglican worship from their own form of Christianity, their own form of Protestantism, which is the Presbyterian belief, which we've talked a little bit about already as well. Okay, um, Presbyterianism is kind of the precursor to the Baptist Church. Okay, not necessarily the same thing, but a lot of the same root and core beliefs. Okay, so uh, again, if you compare the two worship services from Presbyterian and Anglican, they're not too terribly different, but there are some core differences. And so when the Scots decide that they do not want to convert to Anglican worship, many of them end up leaving Scotland and going over to Ireland, okay? Which, of course, has its own troubles because Ireland is Catholic, okay? So again, if you're confused by this point, you are probably not alone, okay? Uh, the, all of the differences in the various religious denominations in Christianity end up coming into direct conflict with each other during this time period, okay? So if you're confused, don't feel bad. I'll try to clarify it as much as I can. Okay. And of course, not all of the Scots want to leave Scotland and leave, and go over to, um, to Ireland, right? Many of them end up revolting against the king because they believe that he is being unjust here. Okay. So we end up with a revolt uh, against Charles here. And Charles decides that he is kind of in over his head at this point. Okay. He realizes that the Scots uh, have more power here than he believed they did. They end up kind of overwhelming him a little bit. And so to try to save his own neck, he ends up reviving Parliament in 1640, okay? Believing that Parliament is going to give him uh, some, he's going to be able to hand over more authority to them, that they can make good decisions here. Um, and Parliament ends up uh, backfiring in Charles's face because they refuse to help him, okay? And so this ends up leading to the Civil War itself, okay? So we have those who are loyal to King Charles, okay, which are called the Royalists, and then we have those who are loyal to Parliament and keeping the King in check, and they're called the Parliamentarians, okay? So it would be, again, the equivalent of if we had a Civil War in modern times, okay, it would be the equivalent of those who are loyal to the President and those who are loyal to the Congress uh, coming into conflict with one another. Now, the leader of the parliamentarians, the ones who support parliament, is a man named Oliver Cromwell, okay, who you see here. And Oliver Cromwell is a Puritan, okay? He is already uh, against what the king believes because the king is an Anglican, okay? Uh, carries forward a lot of the ornamentations and the, the fancy church services and stuff like that. And Cromwell is very uh, simple when it comes to, you know, 
his belief system, but he's also a religious fanatic. Okay, many of the Puritans uh, were very, very eager to um, to enforce their own belief systems in many cases uh, to to purify things. So you might have instances. Um, where even though the Puritans might seem like these very meek and mild individuals, they might break into an Anglican church and smash all images of the saints or images of Christ or the Virgin Mary or something like that, just to hammer home the point, okay? And Cromwell is one of the individuals that kind of falls in line with that group, okay? So he's already unpopular with the monarchy, and now that he's been made the head of the parliamentarians, he's even more unpopular. Now, eventually, Charles is captured by the parliamentarians in 1646. Okay? Uh, he's held prisoner in the Tower of England. He is tried for treason uh, for, you know, for trying to basically uh, exert his authority too much over his people for disbanding Parliament. And eventually, he is beheaded by the people in 1649. Okay? Now, this particular event with Charles being executed is something that... Um, leads to a major disruption of the line of succession in English history. Um, and the individual who steps up to the plate and actually takes over the role of the leader of England is Oliver Cromwell. Okay? And Oliver Cromwell actually does not use the title of king here. Right? He actually very briefly turns England into a military dictatorship and refers to himself as the Lord Protector of England. Okay. Remember, he is a military general, and he uses Puritanism as the basis for his form of rule. Okay. Um, and he doesn't rule for very long. Right? He only rules for just a handful of years here. And as you can imagine, with the people of England being mostly Anglican at this point, they're used to one particular form of belief. To have a minority form of Christianity come in and do a major overhaul and try to get everybody to suddenly convert to Puritanism makes him extremely unpopular. Okay? He outlaws Catholicism and Anglicanism and enforces Puritanism. Okay? So most of the, the common forms of faith that have already been at odds with one another, he outlaws both of them and inserts a third form of religion here. Okay? So again, another reason why he's just so unpopular. Um, eventually, he ends up dying of malaria in 1640 or 1658. Okay, um, and uh, he very briefly tries to pass on the, uh, the the role of Lord Protector to his son, who ends up surrendering not too long thereafter. Okay, his son doesn't hold the title very long, and the royal army comes in. Right, those who are still uh, kind of these renegade royalists, they come in and they end up restoring the monarchy in 1660 with Charles's son, Charles II. Okay? Um, now, when it comes to Oliver Cromwell, another interesting story that goes along with him. Okay? Um, again, because he is the only individual who has ever disrupted the monarchy in the line of succession, um, he is so unpopular that after his death, uh, I think it's a full year after he dies, um, and Charles is actually restored, the supporters of Charles II actually go in and dig up Oliver Cromwell's body, try him for treason, and have him posthumously executed. Okay? In other words, they take his rotting corpse and they hang him by the neck from the battlements of the Tower of England. Okay? <laughs> um, and of course, not too long thereafter, the body falls apart, the head comes off, and the head is then taken and placed on a spike on the Tower of England for a very long time, okay? Uh, and it sits there for several generations, okay? His head sits there being exposed to the wind and the rain and the storms and, and everything else exposed to the elements, okay? Until, as you can imagine, the head ends up rotting partly and falling completely off of that, okay? After that, the head disappears, okay? Now, Fast forward several generations later, okay, to the modern period, 1960s. Um, suddenly, uh, I believe it's the college in uh, Oxford, okay, um, someone comes forward claiming that they own, as a family heirloom, the head of Oliver Cromwell, okay? Now, when this happens, of course, people are in disbelief. They think that this is a hoax. They think it's nonsense and so forth. And someone comes in bearing a wrapped up rotting skull that has been partly mummified, okay, with a hole in the top and in the bottom of it, 
that they believe to be the skull of Oliver Cromwell. Okay. Now, at this point in time, we actually do have DNA testing, right? And people actually begin to test it. And over time, they do confirm, in fact, that this is the skull of Oliver Cromwell, that somewhere along the line, after the skull fell off of the, the spike on the top of the wall, um, apparently one of the guards passing by picked it up, carried it home, and kept it as uh, some weird family heirloom, okay? And was passed down for several hundreds of years until we get to the modern era. Um, and so the skull today has been, um, it's been venerated and it's been reinterred, I believe, at the College of, um, I believe it's uh, Cambridge University, has it buried somewhere on the grounds. Okay. So has it re, uh, reburied somewhere. Okay. So very long, drawn out thing, but for a man to be that hated, to be dug up and posthumously executed, it's not the only time in history this has ever happened either. Um, but this is one of the more bizarre, long, and drawn-out dramas when it comes to the remains of an individual like that. Okay. So Oliver Cromwell, very bizarre individual, okay? very unpopular again, um, but again, one who uh, is extremely important to the history of England. Now, fast forward even a little bit further. Okay? Again, we have Charles II now in line to the English throne. Okay? He is the son of Charles I, as we've already said, the man who was executed. And Charles II is very, very different from his father and grandfather because he actually plays by the rules. He is a good king. Okay? He restores the Anglicanism as being the, the official religion of England. Okay? He agrees to play nice with Parliament, to rule jointly with them, and he is kind of known as the party king. Okay? We enter into a, a brief period of prosperity with him. He has lavish parties. He um, you know, seems to be uh, fairly lax in terms of his laws, right? He's not an oppressive ruler. Problem, though, is when he actually ends up dying in 1685, he has no heirs to speak of, right? He has no sons, he has no daughters, no legitimate ones anyway, okay? And so the throne passes to his younger brother, James II, okay? And James II is everything that Charles II is not, okay? He is a Catholic, okay? And we kind of end up with one step forward, two steps backward here, okay? Charles I starts to steer things in the right direction, then his brother screws it all up again, okay? Um, James II is known for murdering his political enemies, for one thing. Uh, he defies Parliament time and time again. And again, because he's Catholic, we end up with a period of Catholic um, uh, oppression all over again, okay? vis-a-vis -vis what we saw with Queen Mary the first, right? Bloody Mary, okay? So we kind of get this yo-yo situation going on in England at this point, right? You know, each ruler ends up imposing their own form of Christianity here at the expense of everybody else. Now, James has two daughters, two Protestant daughters, especially, named Mary and Anne, okay? And one of these girls is expected to ascend the throne. Okay, she's eventually going to end up marrying someone and rule as the Queen of England. Okay? So people are kind of just biding their time at this point until James dies. Okay? If he dies, then we end up with a Protestant daughter who is going to continue Anglicanism and things are going to be okay in the long run, at least for now. The problem comes, though, in 1688 when James, uh, actually his wife, ends up giving birth to a son. Okay. Now, at this point in time, if, if you recall back to what we saw with the Tudor dynasty, Henry VIII, his multiple wives and children, okay? um, at this point in British history, and to a certain extent this still applies today, not as much as it did though, anytime there is a long line of, if there's a long line of female heirs okay, who have the, uh, the potential to ascend to the throne after the death of their father, okay? um, if there is a son born, even if the son is the youngest child, okay, the son immediately gets pushed to the front of the line, okay, because he's a male, okay, and again, all, uh, you know, gender identity and, you know, belief systems aside in the modern terms, back then this is the way that they did things, okay, and it's, of course, you know, very disagreeable and unpalatable by today's standards. But um, when his son is born, James vows that he is going to raise his son to be a Catholic, okay? And because James is a Catholic and people already don't like the fact that he's a Catholic, 
we end up with another revolt. Okay, People are not willing to uh, abide by this for two generations, and possibly third and fourth and so forth. Right? This could go on for a long time. Now, his daughter, Mary, she ends up being married to a man named William of Orange. Okay, and Orange, we're not talking about the fruit or the color here, Orange is a principality in what is modern day Germany. Okay, he is a, a wealthy prince from Germany. Okay, and so Mary's husband, William of Orange, agrees at her behest to invade England, okay, and supplant James II, to kick him off the throne and take the throne for William and for Mary. Okay. Now, when James hears that this is coming, okay, he hears that William is getting ready to invade, he packs up and runs, okay, leaves and goes to France, okay, because he's Catholic and because France is a Catholic country at this point, he can live in exile there and be protected, okay. And so now we end up with William and Mary ruling jointly as king and queen of England, okay, so we now have William III of Orange becoming William, King William of England, and he co-rules with his wife, Mary II, okay? And this is important, too, because um, typically any time there is a, uh, a monarch who ends up ruling as um, a king or a queen, they typically don't elevate their, uh, their spouse to, the, to a level of equality like this, okay? It's very rare for, for somebody like William to have done this, and admirable, of course, even in, in modern standards. So he is king of England, and she is queen of England. Okay. She's not the queen consort, in other words, right? She's not less than he is, she is an equal, okay? So even if William dies, she is still queen of England, right? She doesn't have to go into, you know, become a lady in waiting or whatever. Okay. And when the two of them end up restoring um, Anglicanism, they end up restoring Parliament, and uh, they agree that they are going to rule jointly with Parliament, just like Charles II did, okay? And now the monarchs are going to be kept in check by the people, okay? William and Mary are willing to accept criticism. They're willing to listen to the people. Um, and that's why this is known as the Glorious Revolution, right? It's, it's glorious in the fact that we don't have an authoritarian monarch anymore, okay? Okay, so all of that serves kind of as the background for everything going on in England while people are beginning to leave England to come to the New World. Okay, so that's why I kind of have to paint a picture for you for the background, for the landscape, to now give you an idea of why people are leaving England. Okay. Um, when it comes to the English, okay, this is kind of a map of what the English colonies end up representing over time. Uh, and you see here the three different colors, right? You have the New England colonies up north, which are all the yellow ones. You have the middle colonies, which are the green ones here. And you have the southern colonies, which are the red ones. Now, the English colonies themselves are driven by different things, again, than what the Spanish are after. Okay? Uh, while the Spanish are looking primarily for wealth, uh, the English colonies are not just looking for wealth. They are also looking specifically, as we've already seen with the, the background of what's going on in England, for a place where they can exercise religious freedom. Okay, and that becomes kind of the, the common narrative that people get in, you know, in grade school and high school and so forth for why the English left England in the first place to come to the New World is for religious freedom. While that is certainly a part of it, right, it's, it's not the case in all cases. Okay? Uh, in some cases, the English are really out looking for the same things in many ways as the Spanish are. Right? They're looking for wealth, not necessarily for gold, right? but they are looking for land and they're looking for natural resources that can be um, exploited and sent back, exported to England. Okay? So they're looking to establish much more permanent colonies than the Spanish are. Now there's different ways that these expeditions are funded. Okay? Uh, one is called a joint stock company, okay? and this is where you have uh, a group of people who come together, and when it comes to religious freedom especially, you might have what amounts to uh, the congregation of a church coming together. Everybody pitches in a little bit of money here, and eventually the money ends up pooling up and becomes a, uh, you know, a pot, essentially, that they can take and invest in a journey to the New World and try to establish a little village for themselves there. 
Okay, that's what a joint stock company ends up becoming. Um, it's not always a religious group though, right? Sometimes you might have people who are wealthy individuals who are all kind of willing to invest in um, what amounts to kind of a camp for maybe something along the lines of logging or, um, or, or fur trapping or something along those lines. The French do more fur trapping uh, and logging really than the British do, but kind of along the same lines here. So you might have, so that's what a joint stock company is. It's a group of people who all invest money into this uh, specific um, project here, and then they all go in together and they share the profits with each other. Okay. Now, the other way of doing this is basically what amounts to a grant, right? It's a, a check, more or less, right, for a specific amount given to people by the monarch, right? A royal charter. Okay. This is where you have a monarch who says, I will give you all the supplies, the ships, um, the, you know, anything that you need to build a colony in the new world, uh, if you can give me good enough reason for why it needs to be there. Okay. So if it's to make money, that's usually a good incentive to get a royal charter. Okay. So these are the two most common ways that people get from England to the new world. Either they pool their resources and do it privately, or they get a royal charter from the king or queen. Now, when it comes to relationships with the Native Americans, okay, uh, we've already seen that the Spanish have treated the natives as inferior, okay, for the most part. Okay, they have looked at them as being um, heathens who automatically need to be um, uh, converted, need to be subdued, need to be made to serve them. But as we've also seen, too, in many cases, the Spanish do end up um, intermarrying. And again, it's it, calling it intermarrying is a loose term for what actually does happen in many cases. Um, unfortunately, there are, of course, probably many undocumented cases of sexual abuse, of rape that leads to childbearing here. But the Spanish and the natives do end up intermingling, I guess is the best way I can put it, to where there are future generations that are born of mixed descent. Okay? And the French do that too, to the same extent, but the French end up having a better rapport with the natives. Okay? They don't try to turn them into servants as much. The French end up actually sending um, colonists in to assimilate into the tribes, right, to try to actually gain their trust to, you know, live and work alongside the tribes, to be kind of in a symbiotic relationship, right? To get along with them, to trade with them, to learn their way of life. So the French will have more success and better relations, okay? Works better for the French in that regard. The English though, when they come over, they view the natives as absolute heathens and devils, okay? They want nothing to do with the natives aside from whatever they can get out of them, okay? In other words, they are not interested in uh, assimilating, they are not interested in the native way of life, they're not interested in their customs, their culture, their religion, they want nothing to do with them except for if the natives can provide them with something. Okay, And for the English, again, this, it's kind of ironic that the English have the most success here because the English are the ones who are not willing to play nice at all. Okay? Um, the English colonies also are the more populous, okay, because uh, when it comes to the French and Spanish, remember the, the Spanish in particular are sending soldiers more than anything else, okay? Just people to keep the peace and to enforce things. And they're sending priests, okay? Priests who are single men. The French also typically send single men, but they do that in a sense to send them as fur trappers, individuals who can then intermarry into the tribe and, and so forth, okay? They send individual agents to do this. When the English come over, though, they bring their entire families, okay? Because remember, these are, in many cases, religious congregations that do this. They're already established as family groups, and so they come over in larger chunks, basically, is what it amounts to. They come over as an already established uh, communal village type situation that basically is just being um, supplanted from England to the New World. So it's no uh, surprise then that there are more women, more children in the English colonies. Um, and in many ways that does end up spelling disaster in the long run because um, again, for the English to not be willing to work on a friendly basis with the natives for the most part, um, they end up doing it to the detriment of themselves and their families, as we'll see. Um, by 1660, there are 58,000 people living in New England 
Okay, so this is uh, you know while the English Civil War is going on, people are basically just pouring out of England. Um, many of them Puritans, uh, and the people who end up setting up camp in New England in the in the New England colonies, right? The Massachusetts Bay Colony, as it becomes known over time, this yellow region on the map. Most of them, probably 90% of them, are Puritans, okay? leaving England because of all the oppression and stuff going on during the English Civil War. Okay? Um, and by 1750, right, once we get, you know, roughly 100 years later, the population has exploded to 1.3 million people, okay? So um, people are coming over in droves, and they, they don't stop, okay? There's no real lull that happens uh, except for just a very brief period of time during the Glorious Revolution, I believe. Okay? Uh, we'll see some of those statistics here in a minute. And the primary goals for English colonies, once the colonists do arrive, okay, um, as I've said before, is to try to set up a way of harnessing and exploiting raw materials of some kind. So timber, uh, fur trapping when it can be found, tobacco is something that they discover, okay, that the Native Americans use as a sacrament. Um, they realize that it can be used for medicinal purposes, it can be used for recreational purposes. And so, of course, people in England view all these types of things as um, novelties, right? It's something they've never seen before. Tobacco, potatoes, certain fruits and vegetables, animals, that kind of thing, are constantly exported back to England, okay? And again, it gives them much more of a uh, 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 leverage with the, with the monarch. Okay, give, makes more royal money come out of the coffers, so to speak. Um, and of course, too, once that ends up happening, try to develop some kind of a consumer market for goods that are manufactured in England. Okay, so basically try to find a way, once you actually get all the raw materials, you ship them back to England, all the raw materials are then converted into products that can then be shipped back to the colonies and sold to the Native Americans. Okay, so... And again, the English at this point don't realize that the Native Americans don't have the exact same way of life that they do, okay? They're not interested in mercantilism. They're not interested in whatever goodies they can necessarily get. Some of them are, okay? Some of them are willing to give up quite a bit of things for uh, a fur hat, for a rifle, right? For something that they can use like that, uh, for, for alcohol, for anything like that, something that they believe is going to impact them positively. Um, but it becomes, again, a tool of exploitation over time for the English to gain more leverage, not only over the monarchy, but also over the Native Americans, as we'll see. Now, the Virginia colony is something that we can uh, discuss really quickly here. Um, the Virginia colony, of course, is the first successful English colony that we end up getting in the Americas. Okay? Uh, it's chartered in 1606 by James I. Okay. Um, and the desire here is to find gold and silver, okay? James is taking a page out of Spain's playbook, okay? Spain has not fully gone into decline yet at this point, um, and James believes that, you know, maybe this is a way for him to bolster things, okay? Remember, his predecessor, Elizabeth I, had no permanent success in actually establishing colonies there, okay? So James thinks he's going to have better success. Um, and James also mandates, in kind of the same way that the Spanish do, to bring Christianity to the natives. In this case, bring Anglicanism rather than Catholicism. Okay? So we're already embroiling <laughs> the Native Americans into sectarian forms of religion here. Okay? Not a great way to start. Um, the Virginia Company arrives in Chesapeake Bay in May of 1607, and they establish Jamestown. Okay? This is an artist's imagination of what Jamestown might have looked like, okay? Um, it has kind of a, and it's a makeshift um, colony, okay? It's a very, very small, um, uh, small village, if, if you can even call it a village. Um, and it's positioned in a very, very poor location, okay? Uh, Jamestown is built in a marsh, okay, a swamp, okay? Uh, there's bugs, the land is not very solid. Um, there's wild game to be found, but, um, the, you know, the ground is treacherous, there is, uh, it's easy for a person to get lost and never be found again, right? There are native tribes all around, that kind of thing. And Jamestown is established kind of as this little triangle-shaped area like this. 
Uh, it has a makeshift fort of sorts, right? It's basically just like a, a little garrison for whatever soldiers did come over. Um, a few thatched huts that are made from whatever timber they can scrounge up, and a church, okay? And that's about it, okay? Uh, the ground is, you know, wet, slopping mud, right? It's, uh, it's not a clean place by any sense of the imagination. Um, and the, the group of tribes that live in the vicinity around them are known as the Powhatan Confederacy, okay? It's 30 different native tribes uh, led by chiefs along the Virginia coast, amounting to somewhere in the neighborhood of about 14,000 natives. Mm -hmm. Powhatan is the name of the supreme chief of the group, okay? And the, uh, the native tribes that uh, that is kind of the head of this group is also called the Powhatan Natives, okay? And they're, they're named specifically for this particular chief, okay? He has his own name that is actually, um, you know, his personal name, but he's known best as Powhatan, okay? Uh, and the leader of the Virginia colony is John Smith, okay? Who you see here, okay? Uh, he's the, the leader of the Virginia colony from 1608 until 1609, okay? So when he actually arrives here in this particular region, he's about 27, 28 years old, I believe. Okay, so this is uh, a portrait of him done much later in life. And John Smith is the one who ends up being very instrumental in uh, the success of the Virginia Company and of Jamestown uh, in general, okay? Um, because one of the major reasons uh, why this particular uh, company was not necessarily destined to succeed is based in some of the practices of what England ended up doing when it came to royal charters in particular, okay? Um, what this amounts to is that anytime a royal charter is put in place, okay, um, the monarch in question doesn't always look at this and send the best agents that they possibly can to the new world, okay? Because they know how dangerous it is, okay? They know that this is a venture from which we've already had a couple of instances where individuals haven't returned, okay? Um, so whether or not there are colonists who are already willing to go to work, um, in many cases, there was a, a lack of um, qualified labor for individuals who were able to go and do this. So quite often what would happen is uh, the monarch might even go so far as to send a royal agent into prisons in England and find individuals who are desperate enough to get out of their current circumstances to potentially go to the new world, okay? Um, they were in many cases given the choice, right? You can serve out your sentence here, okay? Uh, which may even include execution, right? They might even find an individual destined for the gallows and give them the option. Okay, you can go to the scaffold and be hanged, or you can go onto a ship and go to the new world, okay? And the uh, many individuals, quite frankly, would choose the gallows uh, because the new world, as they knew quite well by this point, was a very dangerous place with no guarantee of success, okay? Um, it would be the equivalent of basically uh, you know, jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire, okay? Um, you could uh, die on the journey there from illness or from the ship going down. Uh, you could die once you get there from illness, from an animal attack, from native attacks, from starvation. Um, there, there's a plethora of different um, dangers inherent in, in a journey like this. And of course, the, the primary thing too is that individuals who went on these journeys, quite frankly, never saw England again. Okay, they never saw their families again. They never were able to come home okay, for one reason or another, whether through money, through disaster, or what. So um, the individuals who did, though, say yes to going on to this, individuals who were in prisons, in poor houses, and whatever, um, were individuals who were not qualified to, to be workers. Uh, many of them didn't know how to farm. Many of them didn't know how to build huts didn't know how to do any kind of skilled labor of any kind that would benefit the, the company, except to just be a grunt, right? An individual who can carry out orders, okay? And so in the instance of the Virginia company in particular, most of the individuals who went on this were people who did not know what they were doing. 
Okay? And John Smith, right, being a soldier, being a, a, a sailor, an individual who was trained to do these types of things in a survival situation, was kind of the only saving grace here. Right? He ends up being the one to teach the colonists how to farm, how to build a house, right, how to do all these things. Okay? And if he were not there, Jamestown would have failed very, very quickly. Okay? Um, that being said, it's not a rousing success, right? Statistically speaking, here, okay? Out of the 105 settlers who arrive in Jamestown, only 38 of them survive the first nine months, okay? Uh, because obviously, again, this is a disastrous place to try to set up, okay? Uh, mosquitoes in the vicinity would carry disease. Um, the, the climate is very, very different from what they're used to in England. It's on a similar latitude, but again, the environment is different, okay? There's animals that can be harmful, poisonous snakes, bears, wolves, uh, I mean, you name it. And of course, Native Americans who might end up attacking as well, okay? So this is a, there's all kinds of inherent dangers in being in a place like this. And if nothing else, starvation, okay? Uh, before John Smith can, uh, you know, help them farm and help them plant something, Obviously, uh, you know, if you if you teach people how to farm, right, the plants are not going to sprout up within five minutes, right? It takes several weeks and months for that to occur. So people would end up eating their own boot leather. They would end up eating what animals they brought with them. Um, there, there's desperation inherent in this type of venture. And that leads us into the period that is known as the starving time, okay? Uh, this is a period that lasts in the winter of 1609 to 1610, okay? Now, when it comes to uh, people who are prospective colonists here, okay, not only are the individuals who are given the option to go to the New World, individuals who are, again, uh, perhaps the kind of the dregs of society, the individuals who are the less desirables, criminals, um, uh, debtors, people who are, you know, the, the ill or the infirm, right? England looks at this as a, a potential way of kind of clearing its own society, right? Clearing the, the individuals who are undesirable out of society. Not only that, it's uh, land is advertised to people who are prospective settlers as well, okay? As a way to kind of thin the herd, so to speak, right? To thin out the population of England. Because at this point in time, people are living in squalor. Okay, they're living on top of one another. Um, there, there is disease that's rampant. I believe this is uh, a period where cholera comes in and starts to, to really spread and decimate the population. Um, and so once land is actually advertised, free land, right, if you can afford to make the journey and so forth, there is a massive influx of people who end up going to the New World, but they don't realize that many of them are going there to die. And because, again, there is no guarantee that once you get there, there's going to be a buffet set up. Okay? You're going to have to work for the food that you eat. You're going to have to hunt. You're going to have to farm. You're going to have to build everything from scratch. Okay? And in the winter of 1609 to 1610, the food supply ends up running out okay? because so many people have come over. Okay? And many of these people are basically riding the coattails of individuals who know what they're doing. Okay, so there's only so much food to go around and people end up eating all the food. And the population ends up dropping from about 500 people down to only 60, okay, in the course of a single winter, okay. Now, the image of the young woman that you see over here on the right-hand side, um, there, there's a nickname that's given to this young woman, I forget uh, off the top of my head what her name is. Um, it's, it's a nickname given because we don't know her true name, okay? And this is a facial reconstruction uh, of this young woman. She's believed to be about 14 years old. Um, facial reconstruction of the skull that you see above, okay? Now, the skull, obviously, is in very, very poor condition for a very, very frightening and haunting reason, okay? And it's because during this time period, because people became so incredibly desperate Okay, some of you might see where this is going. Became so desperate that, again, all of the animals were eaten. Okay, all of the uh, the beasts of burden, the oxen that managed to survive the trip, um, the, the the horses that were brought over, domesticated animals, chickens, uh, dogs and cats, rats when they could be found, whatever wild game could be found. But in the midst of winter, wild game knows to to hide. Okay. 
people became so desperate during this particular time period, there are accounts of individuals actually um, committing cannibalism, okay? Uh, and not always on individuals who had recently died either, okay? Um, as disgusting as it sounds, there uh, was at least one or two cases uh, brought forth where individuals had actually uh, dug up corpses from the local graveyard and had, um, you know, eaten what they could, okay? Uh, one individual, uh, I believe, claimed to have eaten his recently deceased wife uh, because of what had happened. Uh, I believe he also ate one of his children. Um, and, of course, this is something where there, there is no, no help coming. And it's, it's impossible to imagine oneself in this type of a situation. Okay? It's very, very easy to say, you know, looking at this at a glance, that is something that we, you know, as civilized individuals would never do. But in, in something like this, it's, it's very difficult to imagine. Okay? People would, you know, try their best to avoid it for sure. Eat grass, eat dirt, eat whatever they could find, chew on their own boots. Um, but, you know, some individuals took it a step further. And finally, when um, Thomas West, the Lord Delaware, who you see here, this is the, the man for whom the state of Delaware is named, by the way. Different spelling, but this is where it comes from. He arrives in June of 1610 and discovers that Jamestown itself has been abandoned. Uh, or actually, when he comes, he discovers Jamestown in squalor. He okay? discovers that uh, only 60 people have survived. He discovers the, the, you know, the partially eaten remains of some humans and so forth. He discovers all the horrors. Okay, it's a horror show when he arrives. And Jamestown is abandoned after he shows up. Okay, he says that we are going to leave this place and we're going to establish a new settlement uh, called uh, Henrico, which eventually becomes Richmond, Virginia. Okay. We're going to leave this place, leave all these horrible memories behind. Um, some individuals are prosecuted, as you can imagine, for this. Um, I don't know any specific court cases or any specific case studies that go along with this, um, but I will provide some primary source material for this in the discussion boards over time. The new governor of Virginia, a man named uh, Sir Thomas Gates, when he arrives, uh, decides he's going to establish very harsh laws and penalties for individuals who end up um, you know, breaking the law. Okay, and any individual who attempts to do this kind of thing is not going to be given any kind of leniency. Okay. Uh, religious uniformity is a very heavy key feature here. Okay, everybody has to practice the same religion. Um, and tobacco becomes the, the, the big export crop in Virginia at this point in time. And it stays that way for a very long period of time, going all the way up until the early 1800s when cotton eventually begins to supplant tobacco. By 1670, though, there are 50 million pounds of tobacco being exported on an annual basis out of Virginia to Europe. Okay, so this becomes the first major cash crop in the Americas is tobacco. Now, a few words need to be said about the famous Pocahontas. Okay. Uh, Pocahontas has been taken as an individual and transformed into something completely different than what she actually was. Okay. Um, the Disney version of what you see of Pocahontas is extremely different, okay, and it's, it's an extremely um, sanitized version of what the character actually was, what she experienced in life, um, and, you know, again, a lot of um, poetic license has been taken to her. For one thing, Pocahontas was 11 years old. Uh, in the midst of her actual story and how it relates to the English colonists, okay? Um, in, the, in the Disney cartoon and in many other film adaptations, uh, she appears to be a teenager or a young adult, okay? So it uh, has to be said that she was only 11 years old when, when all of her, when her story actually began, okay? Um, the famous story of her actually rescuing John Smith from being killed uh, by Powhatan, who was her father, okay, Powhatan, the leader of the Powhatan Confederacy, um, is a true story, okay. Uh, John Smith very unwittingly appears to have wandered into Powhatan territory and um, incurred the wrath of Chief Powhatan, okay, who pinned him down, 
and plan to uh, strike him with a blow to the head with a war club. Okay? And Pocahontas throws herself on top of him to prevent her father from doing this, not because she has any romantic feelings for him. Okay, that's important to understand. Okay, um, between John Smith and Pocahontas, there was never any romantic entanglement. Okay? They were never a couple. John Smith, remember at this point, was 28 years old, and Pocahontas was 11. Okay, so this would be uh, something that would be very, very unsavory in modern terms, and even back then, this would have been um, something that would have been very frowned upon. Okay, so there was no romantic relationship between the two. Uh, she appears to have done it only out of human solidarity, okay? saying that this is a man who she does, she does not believe deserves to be killed. He doesn't understand our customs. We don't need to do this. Okay? Now, the rest of her story diverges very, very heavily from there, okay? from everything that you see in any film adaptations. Um, because for one thing, she is actually kidnapped by the English after they realize... Um, you know, who she is, right? Once John Smith identifies her as the daughter of Powhatan, um, she is kidnapped by the English to try to blackmail Powhatan, okay, into giving the English food and resources, okay? Because remember, this is still in the period of time where the English are um, having a really difficult time putting down roots, okay? John Smith is still struggling to teach people how to farm. Um, I believe this is still even before the 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 starving time that we've discussed when all this occurs, okay? So the, the English are still in a very uh, tenuous relationship with the Powhatan natives, okay? Um, English are, are not really pulling their weight here, okay? And instead of um, being given back over to her father, Pocahontas is actually kept as a hostage by the British. She is baptized in the Christian religion as an Anglican and is renamed Rebecca. Okay, and so you see the image of her here. Um, this is when she is actually anglicized. Okay? She is actually put into English clothing, as you see here, um, and she actually became um, a celebrity in, in English society. Okay? She ends up marrying a young man named John Rolfe. Okay? He is a widower who is uh, the one responsible for introducing tobacco uh, to Jamestown, okay? Tobacco was something that was, um, again, grown by many of the native tribes around, or at least harvested by them anyway. And John Rolfe is the one who takes the tobacco plant and makes it into a local cash crop, and is essentially what makes Jamestown wealthy, okay? So she ends up marrying John Rolfe at a young age, and John Rolfe ends up uh, going back to England and taking Pocahontas with him. Okay, uh, and they have a, a young child together named Thomas uh, in 1616, and she becomes kind of the talk of the town, really. Okay, uh, she is paraded in public. She is uh, made uh, a member of the audience of the royal family, right? She is introduced to the, the highest levels of society in England, and she becomes a novelty, okay? Something that, again, is, um, she's not really treated so much like a human being. She's treated more like a... Um, uh, almost like a zoo exhibit, right, or something like that, right? Just an oddity from the new world, okay? How we can, uh, quote-unquote, civilize a, quote-unquote, savage, okay? So it's, a, it's kind of a demeaning life for her and something, again, vastly different from what she would have expected to um, experience if she had remained in the new world her whole life. Okay? So this is a, a dramatic shift for her. Um, and she also... Uh, you know, I'm kind of jumping on there a little too soon. She actually dies uh, at a very, very young age from uh, from consumption, tuberculosis. Uh, I believe she is only in her 20s when she dies, uh, or actually perhaps not even that. I believe she's only about 19. Okay, So she has a very, very short life, um, one that is obviously much more of a worldly traveled one than, than perhaps she would have had, but, uh, you know, at a very steep cost. Now, to, to get to the topic of indentured servitude, okay, this is um, this is the form of labor that we see exercised in the New World before slavery becomes a reality. Okay, uh, slavery is something that we begin to see evolve over time, beginning in the next um, few decades or so after uh, Jamestown is established. Uh, really, probably closer to 
I would say between 50 and 100 years after Jamestown is established is when slavery actually begins to make uh, a bigger presence. But in that interim, though, we have indentured servitude. And what this amounts to is if you are an indentured servant, okay, indentured basically means that you are uh, the subject of a contract, a binding contract, where you have agreed to exchange several years of labor you know, for yourself. You have basically sold yourself into servitude in exchange for a ticket from England to the New World. Okay? Uh, and quite often indentured servants, again, are individuals who are um, perhaps, uh, again, they may be part of the dregs of society, right? They may be prisoners, they may be individuals who are starving, who have no other option, they have no future in England whatsoever, no one will hire them, no one will give them work. Indentured servants, this may be their only option for survival, okay? And so they agree that they are going to be, um, they're going to serve a certain amount of years in servitude, and then once that contract is up, then they are made into free people who can then go on with the rest of their lives, however that may be. Okay? They might just uh, try to build a house and live in the new world. If they can scrounge together enough money, perhaps they can make it back to England, okay? but that's usually a very rare exception. Okay? Usually it's passage to, to New England and the promise of land that gets people interested in this. Um, and again, this becomes the primary source of labor during what we call the colonial period, okay, from the period between 1610 all the way up until 1775, okay, so even on the eve of the American Revolution, indentured servitude is still the primary source of labor in the Americas, okay. Um, slavery doesn't really become um, as major of, um, uh, ironically, as major of a presence in America until after it's actually outlawed. Okay? Uh, and what I mean by that is, um, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here in terms of history, but um, in 1807, when Thomas Jefferson becomes president, he outlaws the importation of slaves from Africa and from the Caribbean. Okay? And amazingly, from that point forward in time, more people come over to the Americas through illegal slave trade, and slavery becomes much more brutalized and much more of what we um, typically see and hear concerning it. Okay, before that, again, wasn't necessarily better. Okay, slavery doesn't really have a, a sanitized version that can be assigned to it here, um, but uh, but the the level of uh, of individuals brought over, the sheer quantity of individuals and the severity and so forth that goes along with it, much more after the fact, okay? So really, once we get to the 19th century is when slavery hits its peak in terms of cruelty, in terms of vivid imaginations at play in the worst way, okay? Uh, so at this point, it's primarily um, indentured servants who are, who are at work in New England more so than anything. Um, and again, this is, uh, a vast number of people, okay? There's between 350,000 and 500,000 English immigrants who come to the Americas during this time period. And again, could be anybody from uh, poor young men, children, even criminals, um, in some cases, young women, okay? Not always the case, right? Sometimes women can be, can find, you know, some kind of work, uh, you know, as, as laundresses, as seamstresses, whatever, back in England, but typically it was a male-driven um, set of circumstances okay, um, for, for indentured servitude. Um, when it comes to the sick and the elderly, um, people in those circumstances have a much, much harder time of finding uh, even a role as an indentured servant because um, nobody wants them. Okay, You have to provide more care to someone who is ill, uh, to someone who has perhaps lost a, an arm or a leg. Uh, even fingers, perhaps someone who has um, been subjected to uh, smallpox and survived, uh, syphilis and survived, an elderly individual, right? There, there's different um, levels of um, physical and uh, intellectual even disadvantage to, to this, okay? So um, not all individuals qualify for this, okay? Um, most of the men who actually come over as indentured servants do so as laborers. Again, they, they're doing some kind of manual labor. They're working in a field. Uh, perhaps they are apprenticed to someone who is a master craftsman, a smith, a goldsmith, a silversmith, 
um, a, a cooper, which is a barrel maker, uh, a cobbler, uh, a clock maker, right? Something along those lines. And women, again, are typically regulate. Uh, relegated to uh, household servitude, okay? Working as, you know, a cook, a laundress, a seamstress, um, a midwife, perhaps, something along those lines. Um, and indentured servitude carries with it some of um, the same types of um, qualities that slavery does. Um, again, there's, there's no way that you can directly compare the two because slavery uh, there, there are too many undocumented instances of cruelty um, and, and hardship that, that we still don't know about when it comes to slavery. Indentured servitude was much more official, much more documented, um, and the element of racism uh, doesn't really come into play with indentured servitude. So it's, it's, it's apples and oranges in many ways, trying to compare the two. Um, but the, the common qualities that are shared between the two is um, harsh corporal punishment okay, is something that is very common. Um, if you are a, a very willful individual who is put into servitude, if you don't like taking orders, if you refuse to do what is uh, expected of you, um, you can expect to be punished very harshly. Okay? You might be chained up, you might be whipped, um, you might have your, uh, your period of service extended, right? For, for poor behavior, right? All kinds of things. So it's it, you're essentially a prisoner is what it amounts to with very few limited freedoms. Um, and it's only temporary, okay? Uh, slavery initially is something that is considered temporary, okay? From once it actually has its inception, people uh, try to morph it into a similar situation as indentured servitude. But over time, and again, especially once we get into the 19th century, slavery becomes something that is done for life, okay? Um, and as we'll see in future chapters, I'll explain more uh, when it comes to the hardships of slavery, especially once we get into, I believe it's chapter 11. The period of servitude for an indentured servant is usually between four and seven years. Okay? People usually sign a contract stating that they agree to serve for this certain amount of time. And again, if they are put into a position where they are allowed to learn a trade, then it works out for them in the long term. Okay? If they're apprenticed to someone who can teach them a craft, once they leave that person's service, then they can set up shop and become a craftsman and actually earn money and be self-sustaining. Okay, so it's a, there, there is a discipline that's taught along with it that helps people in the long run. Okay? Um, and more specifically for men than for women. Okay. And again, this is still a very heavily patriarchal society. Okay? If you are a woman living in the colonies during this time period, um, you were expected to marry relatively young, at least in, at, as soon as you were able to, okay? Um, and then you basically live under the auspices of your husband for the remainder of your life. Um, once people are released from servitude, they are quite often given what has been nicknamed their freedom dues, okay? Sometimes they're given tools if they have a craft to work with. They're given clothing and food. In some cases, they're given a parcel of land to build their own home and so forth. So it's kind of like a, a starter kit for a new life, essentially. Um, and there is an opportunity to rise in social status as well, okay? If you are freed from indentured servitude, you can make a respectful name for yourself. Um, several instances in the early forms of the colonies, individuals who were members of um, uh, kind of a local early form of a parliamentary system, um, you know, uh, people who were influential politicians at the time were former indentured servants. Okay, they were able to rise in status that way. Um, but when it comes to personal rights as an indentured servant, there are very few of them. Okay, you are not allowed to marry if you were an indentured servant unless you have explicit permission from your master, essentially, the, the individual you've been apprenticed to. Um, and usually that's shot down, okay? Um, so taking on a wife from an early age if you were an indentured servant uh, is, is a rare thing, okay? Um, and of course, you might have to have some kind of a chaperone to go with you if you go into town or something like that. Um, there, there are still limits to what you were able to accomplish. And again, very harsh punishments if you break that. Final thing we can talk about for the first part of chapter two here is an instance known as Bacon's Rebellion, okay? And this stems from the system of indentured servitude, okay? 
what it amounts to is it begins with the idea that in Virginia in particular, there is a very, very large number of settlers, as we've already said, okay, beginning with the starving time and even before then, there is a massive influx of people coming to Virginia because it's so heavily advertised. Okay? Um, and once people do arrive there, it's not always the poor and disenfranchised who come. Sometimes it is individuals who are extremely wealthy who are looking to basically have a second home in the countryside type of thing. So you might have a very wealthy lord from England who comes over to try to establish more land and more authority for themselves in the new world. And a lot of the social tensions, the class struggles and so forth between peasants and wealthy individuals gets transplanted from England to the new world. Okay. Um, most of the wealthy planters, the individuals who uh, believe that they can invest money in crops like tobacco and make a lot of money off of it, they desire the same type of uh, wealthy hierarchy that they enjoy in England, right? They just want to make more money, okay? And they do it, again, at the expense of peasants, okay? And as we talked about, this is a similar type of situation to what we saw with the feudal system, okay? Back before the Black Death happened and all that, this was the worst way that you could see powerful individuals exploiting people who have no power. Turn them into servants to make money for you. Okay? And again, in many instances, even if you are an indentured servant, um, there's not really always a guarantee that you're going to get that little freedom package. Okay? You're not always going to get money or food or clothing or land or tools or anything. Okay? Um, many times servants are left to be homeless and impoverished, okay? Um, they might have a craft that makes them some money and they can be successful, but not always, okay? Um, in many cases, they are forced to, to poach animals to, um, to you know, feed themselves, if nothing else. Um, and about one-fourth of all freed indentured servants have no land. They're not given any, okay? Um, quite frankly, because mainly some of their masters are not even uh, qualified to own land, okay? So it's not a, it's not a secure system in any sense of the word. Um, the primary source of Bacon's rebellion surrounds an individual named Nathaniel Bacon, who you see here. Okay? Uh, he is a wealthy landowner uh, who ends up getting into a feud with uh, some of the local Native Americans. Okay? Uh, Nathaniel Bacon owns several pigs. Okay, Pigs, bacon, kind of a funny little parallel there. Um, and he accuses the natives of coming in and stealing some of his pigs um, for, for food, okay? And tries to bring this um, to, uh, to the local government as a, as a complaint, right? To do something about this, okay? And it's not only his problem with the natives, a lot of the poor whites who live in the neighborhood, right? Individuals who are impoverished, individuals who are freed indentured servants, um, claim that they are having the same problems. Many of them, though, are doing this, getting involved to try to um, gain some kind of benefit out of this, right? To gain compensation, to maybe gain animals for themselves because they don't have a way of, of feeding themselves, okay? So that's how this kind of segues into what we're talking about here. The government, though, refuses to do anything about it, okay? And Nathaniel Bacon is so fed up with what's happening here. He believes he's losing money. He believes he's being infringed upon. He pulls together a group of 1,000 men and claims that he is going to go on a rampage and kill all Native Americans living in the territory of Virginia. Okay, it's a pretty stout number of people, right? Several thousands of people. And he is going to also free all indentured servants. Okay, so he thinks that he is going to somehow do everybody a favor by doing this. Um, the local English governor, William Berkeley, who you see here, is accused by Bacon of corruption, okay, for not doing anything about this, and is actually captured by Bacon and his, um, and his band, okay, and held prisoner, okay, held hostage. Bacon and his group actually end up marching on Jamestown, and they burn it to the ground, as you see here in the image. Um, and over time, um, Bacon ends up succumbing to a fever the same year that the rebellion begins, and he ends up uh, dying not too long thereafter. Once that happens, uh, the rebellion ends up losing steam, it ends up fizzling out, and um, it uh, kind of ends up you know, 
disappearing altogether. So this is actually the first instance that we have in the Americas that is the most well documented anyway of some kind of a, a protest situation. Okay, and this is before America exists as a um, as an actual entity. Okay, this is still a, an English colony. Um, but it's the first instance, though, in the Americas where we have class struggle protests taking place, okay? where you have individuals who are members of a, a poor or working class protesting against um, what the wealthy individuals are doing, okay? taking them hostage, you know, being violent, burning things to the ground, and so forth. Um, and not too long after that, Berkeley is actually recalled to England, where he also dies of a fever not too long thereafter. Okay? So um, it's a very... Um, uh, kind of a, a you know a squalid affair to to speak of here, okay? But um, class struggle is something that is kind of a, a key feature of early life in the colonies, right? That it's not a peaceful coexistence between colonists and natives, or even among the colonists themselves, as we see here. Okay, so that wraps us up for the first half of chapter two. Um, now we'll move on to the second half, and we'll discuss some of the more ins and outs of the middle colonies and some of the southern colonies.